And Annie Og has too much common sense to take offence. She pockets the dollar, has a good drink, and later tells the lady from Ankhma Pork enough to satisfy her, but without giving away the deeper, more private customs of her own community, what she calls the real stuff, like the dark moths. I do hope that one day Patrick will tell us more about the Ankhma Pork folks at Dance and Song Society. <laughs> In Hogfather, we can. Oh, don't you mean against the wall? <laughs> it's I don't know why. Uh, in Hogfather, we can watch a brief, unplanned, and altogether unfortunate encounter between another of the ladies folklorists of the city, who is enthusiastically busy reviving the fine old folk tradition and the final phase of that same tradition as it survives on the streets of Ankhma Pork. The custom in question is that of singing and music making at midwinter, something rather like our carol singing, but with magical rather than <coughs> religious connotations. <coughs> on the disc, Terry explains, people, quote, people have always had the urge to sing and clang things <laughs> at the dark stub of the year when all sorts of psychic nastiness has taken advantage of the long grey days and shadows to lurk and breed. <laughs> Lately, people in Ankhma Pork's better districts had taken to singing harmoniously, <laughs> which rather spoilt the effect. <laughs> <laughs> Those who really understood just clanged something and shouted. <laughs> and who are those who really understood? I put that picture, if I was, uh, computer savvy, I would in some way be able to, you can come and look at this afterwards, it's one of, <coughs> I've got paper in the way, uh, it's one of Paul Kidby's illustrations, I think Kidby's a marvellous interpreter of this world. Uh, they are a group of beggars, so disgusting that they aren't even allowed to join the beggars league. <laughs> 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 they are collectively known as uh, wait a moment. the canting crew, I think. <laughs> yes, the canting crew. The main members are foul old Ron, sticking to high heaven and muttering unintelligibly. Millennium hand and trip ship. I told him, I told him, I told him, but I told him, Millennium hand and ship. <laughs> then there's Coffin Henry, so called because he's Coffin. The duck man, who goes around imagining he's got a duck on his head. <laughs> Why? And Arnold Sideways, a nebulous, <coughs> crazy cripple whom the others drag about with them on a little wooden trolley. And there's also a mangy dog. On this occasion, they are banging saucepans and bellowing tunelessly, uh, apart from Duck Man, who's got a decent tenor voice. <laughs> and they know very well that people will give them money to go away and infest <laughs> some other streets. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, Terry is exaggerating a wee bit, just a wee bit. Nevertheless, we can trace a definite curve in the history of many British folk customs, whereby things which were widely practiced at every social level in medieval Tudor and early Stuart times were gradually crushed by various pressures. There was great Protestant disapproval from Elizabethan time on. In the 18th century, the social elite became increasingly hostile and contemptuous in its attitude towards traditional customs and disengaged themselves from communal festivities. To this, Victorians added a horror of the rowdiness and drunkenness so often seen at working class celebrations. Uh, after what we heard this afternoon, I think you will understand why. <laughs> The result was that national customs became fragmented into localized forms and slipped down the social scale till they were little more than a way for the poorest of the working class to extract a little beer money from their betters at festive seasons. One well-documented example of the process is the history of the May Day displays put on by urban chimney sweeps in London and many city, towns and cities. 
Uh, I can heartily recommend Roy Judge's excellent study, The Jack in the Green. And not a folklore study, but a vivid little picture. Uh, Dickens, one of his essays uh, oh, in Sketches by Boz about May Day sweeps going out all jaunty with their Jack in the Green on the May Day morning and coming back in the evening uh, tired, drunk, uh, dishevelled, having spent all the money that they'd managed to get earlier in the day and picking quarrels as they reel home. Uh, they're not exactly the canting crew of beggars, but they're well on the way. <laughs> on the other hand, by the end of the 19th century, an opposite uh, fashion had become, uh, an opposite trend had become fashionable. There were influential authors, including Sir Walter Scott, a prominent example, who wrote glowing descriptions of a supposed golden age in Merry England in Elizabethan times, with squire and parson and common people all united in simple customs and innocent merriment. <laughs> Inspired by nostalgic enthusiasm, the late Victorian local gentry, school teachers and clergy, encouraged the revival uh, of folk festivals, provided they were well organized <laughs> and stripped of any subversive or unseemly elements. And that's just what was going on in Acma Pork. <laughs> Respectable people had discovered the tradition of midwinter singing, so now there were enthusiastic and delightfully melodious wassailers who put in weeks of practice before setting out to spread seasonal cheer on the streets of Ankma Bork at Hogswatch. The best and most harmonious choral group was rung by a certain Mrs. Anna Glifter Huggs. Quote, the singers were halfway down Park Lane now and halfway through the red rosy hen greets the dawn of day in marvellous harmony. Their collecting tins were already full of donations for the poor of the city, uh, or at least those sections of the poor who, in Mrs. Hubbs's opinion, were suitably picturesque and not too smelly and could be relied upon to say thank you. <laughs> in fact, the hen is not the bird traditionally associated with heralding a new sunrise, but Mrs. Hugs, while collecting many of the old folk songs for posterity, had taken care to rewrite them when necessary, <laughs> to avoid, as she put it, offending those of a refined disposition with unwarranted coarseness. <laughs> Much to her surprise, people often couldn't spot the unwarranted coarseness until it had been pointed out. <laughs> uh, can you guess why she's not a hen? Uh, <laughs> continue quote. Mrs. Hugs had heard that wassailing was an ancient ritual, and you didn't need anyone to tell you what that meant but she felt she'd carefully removed all those elements that would have found the effect of the hind ear. Well, it's not surprising to learn that when this well bred choir, so beautifully far from anything that could distress either the musical or the moral susceptibilities of their audience, came face to face with what might well be the last vestige of pure, raw wassailing in Ankhma Pork, this gang of deranged beggars in full disordered <coughs> fellow, it was the choir that turned and fled. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, mindful of the history of English folk song revival, uh, one can only say, ouch. <laughs> and it was not only our equivalents of Mrs. Hugs who went about among smoothing folk tunes to fit the piano, turning folk songs into four-part harmony, and zealously vulgarizing the words. Even the great Cecil Sharp, who noted tunes as exactly as possible, had no respect for the texts at all. As Steve Roud puts it, in Sharp's publications, quote, the words suffered every possible editorial indignity, being softened, <laughs> amalgamated, tidied up, and in some early cases completely rewritten, 
to produce singable versions which would suit the tastes of the Edwardian music buying public and which could be taught to school children. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we had our Mrs. Hugs, oh God, we did. <laughs> the, turning now to Hogfather. In Hogfather, Terry Pratchett also touches upon an, another major aspect of modern life which damages folk tradition, the pressure of commercialization. It affects Hogwatch night, which is the disc word equivalent of Christmas. There's a delicious scene, uh, unfortunately too long to quote, uh, which is set in a very upmarket toy shop uh, in the best quarters of Acmapork. Every year this shop has a beautiful artistic hogfather's grotto, complete with pixies, animated dolls of all nations, a magic tinkling waterfall, and hogfather's starry sleigh embellished with silver curly bits and drawn by charming pink pappy mashy pigs. <laughs> uh, perhaps I ought to explain that in the mythology of Discworld, Hogfather, who is their equivalent to Father Christmas, he, he goes through the sky in a sl sledge, but it's not drawn by reindeer, it's drawn by a team of wild boars. And everything to do with Hogwatch is connected with pigs and pork and sausages. The, the feasts are sausage-based uh, and so on. Uh, so hence, uh, that's why in the pretty grotto in the upmarket shop, uh, the silver sledge, say, is drawn by, uh, where are we, I've lost my place, charming pink papier mâché pigs. In the grotto sits a grumbling old man in red and white costume who has been hired to let small kids climb onto his lap and tell him what presents they want. Though, of course, he never pays any attention to them, he is watching to see what their mothers have already decided to buy for them. <laughs> but this year, calamity. Through the hoof and into the lovely glittery display crashes a rough sledge built of crudely sawn tree trunks on massive wooden runners drawn by four wild boars, huge, grey, bristly, smelly. The real hog father has dropped in. <laughs> Actually, it's not the real Hogfather at all, it's, dress, it's death dressed up as him. And it will take much too long to explain why. <laughs> and the effect is more or less the same. Uh, and to make matters worse, death playing the part of Hogfather, uh, death is a very kind-hearted but rather literal-minded fellow, and he assumes that it's his job actually to give presents to the children. So he starts, instead of selling the stuff that's in the shop, he starts giving it away. And he gives the children what they really want, not what their mummies think they should want. And then one of the great white boars does a wee-wee all down the main stairs. Uh, chaos ensues. So that's what happens, uh, how commercialization, which has prettified <coughs> and demolished an old belief itself crashes when the supernatural reality comes back like a vengeance. In the Discworld cities, as on earth, old folklore discarded by adults is sometimes kept going for a few generations by children. According to the bursar of Unseen University in Ankhmapork, when he was a boy, there was a custom on Soul Cake Tuesday that children would roll boiled eggs down the tump, uh, which is a large, steep hill on the outskirts of Ankhmapork. If the parallels with Earth are valid, uh, well, I think we can assume that this would once have been an amusement for the whole community, Though naturally nobody could say what the point of it was, apart from the fairly obvious fact that it is fun and that the eggs are nice to eat, even if they do get a bit cracked and muddy. Urban children, or especially the slum children, also have pleasures of their own, 
not inherited <coughs> from adults, but which they teach to one another. In the poorest parts of Ankhma Pork, slum kids fiercely play brutal and unhygienic street games hallowed by long tradition. These include dead rat conkers <laughs> and tiddly rat, though the once popular turd races in the gutter <laughs> to have died out, quote, despite an attempt to take them up market with the name Foo Sticks. <laughs> Song and Dance Society knows nothing whatever about such things. <laughs> Their automatic assumption, like that of our own Victorian and Edwardian forebears, is that folklore is necessary, archaic and rural. They simply never imagined that it might be worthwhile to take a look at their own city. Just as, I'm sorry to say, you can search through the index of I think pretty well any collection of British regional folklore from that period without finding a single mention of that region's major city. Manchester, Liverpool, Glasgow, let alone London, they never feature in the classic Victorian folklore collections. Mm. It will be quite some time before the Discworld equivalents of Iona and Peter Opie descend on the children of Anthema Pork to record <laughs> games in streets and play craft. Certain other adults, however, do know that children have a natural affinity with folklore and that it can be exploited. <laughs> Thus, parents have repeatedly discovered, both in that world and this, that the best way to control a child is by working <coughs> on its imagination to create a terrifying anthropomorphic personification. Uh, something which Terry Pratchett calls a frightener and forbidden monster, and most folklorists just call a bogey that. <laughs> For example, uh, these are this world examples, not folk, not discworld ones. Behave yourself while I'm out. Remember that raw head and bloody bones is watching you. <laughs> Keep clear of that pond, or Jenny Green Teeth will drag you in and drown you. She exists both in Britain and on the disc, Jenny Green Teeth, she gets about quite a bit. <laughs> Used in moderation, these frighteners and prohibitory monsters have a great deal to recommend them. But overdoing it is cruel. The problem seems to be at its worst in cities. True, there are fewer natural dangers there, but semi-sadistic adults still enjoy inducing irrational fears as Susan Stowe Hellett found when she became a governess in Ankhma Pork. Uh, that's also in the Hogwarts book that there's this uh, practical young governess. Her predecessor in the job had used frighteners all the time. According to that woman, there was always something waiting to eat or carry off bad boys and girls for sins like stuttering, or defiantly and aggravatingly persisting in writing with their left hand. <laughs> there was always a scissor man waiting for the little girl who sucked her thumb, always a bogeyman in the cellar, uh, not to mention the bears that stood around in the streets to eat you if you trod on a crack of the pavement. <laughs> One last social group plays a large role in perpetuating traditional customs in Ankhma Pork, and it's rather a <coughs> surprising one. Not beggars, not children, not those trying to bring up children, but the venerable wizards of the very wealthy Unseen University, which is the Discworld's equivalent uh, to um, Oxford or Cambridge with their eccentric, wine-loving, lazy, uh, very peculiar dons, uh, as they were, not that afraid nowadays, but a few generations ago. Year by year, the
The dons are the, the wizards of Unseen University, unfailingly carry out certain obscure ceremonies and obey certain obscure injunctions. For instance, they have to keep burning a certain monstrously huge candle, or rather a mountain of tallow, a mega candle aggregated from the stubs of many, many thousands of candles that had gone before, which had allegedly first been lit on the very night the university was founded, maybe 2,000 years ago, and had never gone out since. For Unseen University took tradition very seriously, uh, at least when it remembered to. <laughs> Occasionally, the wizards made a tradition out of not observing a tradition, th thereby creating, so to speak, a tradition square, which was even more traditional and <laughs> Not that the wizards are curious as to the origins or meanings of what they do. Nobody, for instance, has any idea why, in obedience to a long ago bequest, a small current bun <coughs> and one copper penny must be laid on a high stone shelf in a certain vestibule every other Wednesday. <laughs> This ignorance doesn't matter. As Terry says, the ceremony still carries on, of course. If you left off traditions because you didn't know why they started, you'd be no better than a foreigner. <laughs> <laughs> and elsewhere he says, very few people know how tradition is supposed to go. There's a certain mysterious ridiculousness about it by its very nature. Once there was a reason why you had to carry a posy of primroses on Soul Cave Tuesday, but now you did it because that's what is done. Some of Unseen University's customs impinge upon the townsfolk of Acma Pork. One such is blessing in top. One such is beating the bounds every 22nd of Gahoon. I'm afraid I've forgotten. I think Gahoon is one of the summer months. I should have checked in the calendar before I came. I think, I think it's summer. This involves a choir, all able-bodied members of staff, and a gaggle of students retracing the exact route of the boundaries of the university as first laid down 2,000 years ago. They walk through, or if necessary, climb over any buildings that have since been built across the route, while ceremonially striking members of the public with live ferrets. <laughs> in, in memory, for reasons unknown, of a long ago Arch Chancellor Buckleby. <laughs> in Britain and Europe, processions to beat the bounds do not often survive in towns. Uh, you get them in the country. But in Oxford, on Ascension Day, there are two parishes which still provide a spectacle very like what you would see in Ankhma Pork, uh, but without the ferrets. Then to quote Steve Roud again, this time from his calendar customs book, The English Year, he says, the boundary markers in Oxford can be set high into walls, high or low, or even into the floor and can be down narrow alleyways, in basements, and behind or inside buildings. The hooks take in the college buildings within the parish, as well as shops and pubs, much to the surprise of people they meet on the way. They stop for refreshments at various locations, and at one point students throw coins and sweets for choir boys to scramble for. And that is authentic. Oxford, you can apparently go and see it on Ascension Day any year. <coughs> in Unseen Academicals, Terry tells us that once in every hundred years, the midnight silence of Unseen University is torn by the clatter of hobnailed boots and cries of, Oh, the Megapode! Oh, the Megapode! Members of the senior faculty, each carried piggyback by a stout bowler hat at university, <laughs> are in hot pursuit of one of their number who flees before him. He wears a special headdress involving a huge yellow and red beak and utters doleful quacks. <laughs> the explanation, insofar as it is one, is given by Pontiac.
Ponder Stibbons, that unfortunate wizard who has all the jobs going, including that of being master of traditions. Ponder says, the original megaphone was found in the underbutler's pantry. It escaped in the middle of dinner and caused what my predecessor 1100 years ago called, he referred to a large book, called a veritable hey-ho rumbolo as all the fellows pursued it through the college buildings with much mirth and good spirits. <coughs> Do you think ever invented this out of nothing? No. <laughs> One of Britain's most respected academic institutions, also as College Oxford, can boast of something very, very similar the hunting of the mallet. <laughs> it began, probably in Tudor times, as an annual custom, but was later reduced to just once a hundred years, being held in 1801, 1901, 2001. I doubt that any of us will be there to see it. <laughs> <laughs> According to the legend of Old Souls College, Workmen discovered this mallard in a drain while the foundations of the college were being laid in 1437, but it escaped and flew off, and so every 14th of January was declared to be mallard night. <laughs> the fellows and their friends enjoyed a lavish and <coughs> prolonged supper, and my God, I do mean lavish and prolonged. The 1801 had got 14, 14 courses, according to the internet. Uh, anyway. They enjoyed a lavish and prolonged supper presided over by one of their number who was to be named the Lord Mallard. Then at midnight, they set out in procession carrying lanterns and torches and singing the rather odd Mallard song to search every nook and cranny of the college in the hope of finding the lost duck from cellar to attic and up onto the roof. Honestly. And so they still do, once every hundred years. <coughs> the chorus of the mallet song goes, Ho, the blood of King Edward, ho, by the blood of King Edward, it was a swapping, swapping mallet. <laughs> 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 uh, now, Terry doesn't have any song accompanying his hunt of the megaphone. And when I was talking with him once, I said to him, uh, why don't you have a song? And he said, song? What song? So I told him, oh, by the blood of King Edward, it was a swapping, swapping mallard. And Terry said, which King Edward? <laughs> <laughs> what have kings got to do with it anyway? And I said, nobody knows. Ah, said Herr Terry with a very happy sigh. If nobody knows, then that's proper folklore. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
The Dark Morris is in uh, Reaper Man. Um, and in Winchester. Quite near, I think it's the very end of Reaper Man, isn't it? It's, if it's not the actual last paragraph, it's jolly near the end of the book. Any more questions? Can we show appreciation once more? Oh.